Hello, Christian Krabbenhoff from the University of Liverpool. Introduction to limit analysis is the uh, topic of these uh, few slides that I have uh, put together. I'll be doing some runs as well with Optum G2. Um, limit analysis is at the very heart of the program Optum G2 and also um, Optum G3. Um, this is the most basic analysis type, you can say, uh, and all other analysis types, for example, in elastoplastic analysis builds really on limit analysis. So um, it, it's a very uh, fundamental uh, part of uh, these programs, Optum G2 and G3. Now, it is, of course, also something that is important in um, especially in civil engineering, uh, in both in structural engineering and in um, geotechnical engineering. It's something that's uh, very important and something that's very classical. Here is, uh, I think, probably one of the oldest illustrations of a limit analysis problem um, from Galileo's uh, book, uh, Dialogue Concerning Two New Sciences, 1638. He has this clamp beam and the question is how large a mass can be suspended from the uh, tip of this beam or in more modern uh, terminology um, we would use sort of these symbols a clamp beam fully support uh, uh, fully fixed here at the one end certain length um, the cross section certain dimensions and of course a certain material I think this looks like a wooden beam could also have been a steel beam or a reinforced concrete beam and the question is, what is the maximum force that we can apply here at the end of the beam um, before it, it collapses? That is the central question of limit analysis, and that's a question that can be generalized to a very large variety of uh, practically relevant situations and applications. One of them, uh, or a lot of them, are in, um, are in geotechnical engineering. An example here, classical problem, a strip footing on a soil, it says here it's a clay, so let's let's say it's a clay, uh, and there's a, a foundation, and the question is what is the maximum load that you can apply here at the top of the foundation before this foundation fails? That is a classical limit analysis problem, and actually one that we'll deal with later on here in, this, um, in these slides. Now, for those of you who are familiar with, with finite element analysis, um, uh, and I think uh, that is something um, um, that is fairly well known how that works. Well, then what you would do when you have a problem like this, you would mesh the problem. So you would subdivide the domain into finite elements uh, over uh, which you approximate the governing equations. And um, you set up the stiffness matrices and all the rest, follow a sort of a, a textbook type procedure and you proceed to um, basically increase the load here on the top of the foundation from from zero and up until the displacements are sufficiently large for you to be able to say that you're at failure or, or anyway close to failure. So you produce this famous load displacement curve. And, um, and you would then read off the um, limit load, the collapse load, as the level of here. So that's one way of doing it, um, and as I said, when using the finite element method, you solve the full set of governing equations, that's equilibrium equations, strain displacement relations, the constitutive relations, and so on. You take all the governing equations and you come up with an approximate solution to these equations, and that generates then um, this approximate load displacement curve. You get an approximate limit load. Um, you don't know how good this is or how bad it is, you just know that it's an approximation and the more elements you use, the closer to the exact solution you should be. Now if you're just interested in the limit load, and a lot of the time that is really the, relevant, the, the most important quantity, um, then you don't really need this full load displacement curve. There's no real reason for, for um, you don't really need it, and, and the only way, it, it, the only reason I think it's gained such prominence <laughs> is that um, it's used for this purpose of basically determining the limit load. Now, limit analysis uh, offers a, a shortcut 
to solving the full set of governing equations um, as is done in an approximate form in the um, final element method. Uh, it namely uh, allows you to solve part of the governing equations um, and another part of the governing equations and in this way, and I'll go through the details in, in the following slides, and in this way come up with two estimates of the limit load, one from below and one from above. So let's say that this load displacement curve was actually the exact load displacement curve. So let's suppose it had been solved with a uh, final element program with millions and millions of elements and we were sure this was the exact solution to within a, a, a neg neg negligible margin of error. Well then limit analysis uh, would allow you to calculate uh, not the full load displacement curve but an estimate of the collapse load without having to go through this load displacement um, or this um, yeah, incremental step-by-step -step, uh, load displacement analysis. But with one direct calculation you would find a lower bound on the exact solution and another direct calculation you'd find an upper bound on the exact solution. If you do this with with a, in a finite element sense as well, if you use a finite element mesh as the basis for computing these two solutions, well then you have exactly the same properties in, as in conventional finite elements. The finer the mesh is, the better the solutions are. And with finite element limit analysis, it's exactly the same. The finer the mesh is, the smaller the gap between the upper and lower bounds is until uh, you eventually have a fine enough mesh and the two estimates are more or less identical and you know that you have found the exact solution. But even with, with say, with, with, with moderate or with very coarse meshes, you still have these um, two bounds um, and you know that the exact solution is somewhere in between. It doesn't have to be exactly right in between, but it's somewhere in between. So you have an estimate basically of the error that you have made. Whereas with conventional FE, you don't know where you are. Um, you know it's an estimate, you know it's an approximation, but you know, don't know how good this approximation is. You don't know if it's on the safe side, is it on the unsafe side. Usually of course it tends to be on the unsafe side. Usually the limit load decreases as you increase the number of elements. With limit analysis you have the possibility to calculate a lower bound, which of course for, for let's say design purposes is something that is convenient, especially in in conjunction with an upper bound estimate as well. So you know how much error uh, or the worst case error that you are making by using the lower bound as a basis for uh, your design is. So so um, so limit analysis, classical limit analysis is based on two methods or we also call them two theorems. I'll c I've said theorem here, the lower bound theorem and the upper bound theorem. And the lower bound theorem says that for a structure of a perfectly plastic material subjected to a set of loads, such a structure will not collapse if we can find a stress field that satisfies the equilibrium equations, the stress boundary conditions, and the yield condition. So since the structure will not collapse if we can satisfy th these conditions, well, then the load um, under which it will not collapse is obviously a lower bound on the exact solution. It may also be a higher load that will bring about a uh, situation that will not collapse. We don't know. We will have to check if the um, conditions are satisfied as well. So if I use this, if we use sort of a discrete model as the basis, what I'm saying is suppose we have a load here of 100 kPa. Now if I can find a stress field, forget about displacements, forget about strains, there's no kinematics, there's no stre uh, strains or displacements at all involved. It's only stresses. I need to find a stress field that satisfies the equilibrium equations everywhere, uh, that satisfies the stress boundary conditions. So up here on the free edge, I should have zero normal and shear stress. Up here um, on the foundation, at the top of the foundation, I should have zero shear stress, and I should have a normal stress um, in equilibrium with the uh, 100 kPa of applied external load. And I should also have the yield condition or the failure criterion satisfied everywhere. So more Coulomb or Tresca or Mises, whatever you uh, have that is relevant for the material in question, should be satisfied everywhere. If I can find such a stress field, well then the structure will not collapse under this load of 100 
kPa. It might also not collapse under a load of 150. Then I don't know, I'd have to verify that I can find another stress field that satisfies all the conditions. So that is how the lower bound uh, theorem works, so equilibrium, and that's these in 2D partial differential equations here. And just uh, to give you an example of, of, of how it works, uh, so a geostatic stress field, um, you could say you have a linear variation of the stress in the y direction, so gamma times y, gamma being the unit weight and y being the coordinate, and you could then uh, say, okay, in the other direction, in the x direction, horizontally, I have some, uh, 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 I have some uh, fraction of sigma y given by the earth pressure coefficient k0. So sigma x is some constant k0, 0.3 or 0.4, whatever, times sigma y. So it's k0 gamma y. And then um, I would insert into the equilibrium equations. So the first one here, well, uh, take sigma x and differentiate with respect to x. That's zero. There's no shear stress here, so that's zero. And this is a zero as well, the unit weight in the x direction. So that equilibrium equation is satisfied. And the other one, take sigma y, differentiate with respect to y. That is gamma. Here we have zero, and here we have minus gamma. So that adds up to zero, and that equation is satisfied as well. So um, that is uh, how the equilibrium equations look. The stress boundary conditions, well, um, that's to do with the normal and shear stresses, you could say. So on a loaded edge, the normal and shear stresses are different from zero. They are basically such that they are in balance with the externally applied load. On a free edge, they're both zero. On a supported edge, which is what this here down here represents, well, they are not known a priori. They are basically, um, you could say, the reactions. So they are found as as determined as part of, of solving the problem. So uh, we work with stress fields only. And then there's the yield condition as well, which I will uh, just um, come to now uh, through an example. And that is a uh, strip footing on a weightless um, undrained clay. Could also be with weight, but let's just say that it's weightless. Um, and the um, strength criterion or the yield condition that we'll use here is that of Tresca, which actually, of course, is a, is a, is a special case of more Coulomb, but, but never mind. Um, so it says that sigma 1 minus sigma 3, the major and the, the difference between the major and the minor principal stress must not exceed 2 Cu, Cu being the undrained shear strength. We also call that Su, I think, in Optum G2. So, um, that is, a, that is a condition that must be satisfied. And um, how do we then construct a solution? Well, we could, um, we, could, we could draw sort of three, consider three patches with a constant stress within each patch. You could say the vertical here would be sigma 1. We call that sigma 1, the other one sigma 3. Or uh, since we don't have any shear stresses here, we would just call these sigma y and sigma x. It doesn't really matter what we call them. But the difference between these two stresses must not exceed uh, 2 Cu. And then uh, the equilibrium equations, they're all satisfied automatically um, in a way because we have constant stresses and anything constant differentiated with respect to, to anything, x or y, is zero. The unit weight is zero, so they are automatically satisfied by the choice of these three patches with constant stress. Um, then we come to the um, actually uh, stress boundary conditions and, and how do they look? Well, um, here in the central patch, the stress here must of course balance the applied stress. Okay, so if that is, this is called Q, well, we would have a stress equal to Q here. Uh, at the sides, well, we have a free edge, so there's no normal stress here. It's zero. And then we have the horizontal stresses here. Um, and we can call them P, and, and they're P throughout the domain, the idea being that we have as well, and it's a kind of a stress boundary condition, it's an interface condition, must have equilibrium, of course, between these patches as well. 
and uh, so if it's the stress is called p well then it's it's p over here as well and over here so we have you could say two variables we we need to pick these p and q uh, determine those such that um, all the conditions are satisfied the equilibrium equations are already satisfied the uh, stress boundary conditions are also automatically satisfied by this choice we have made so far so then there's only the yield condition left and the yield condition says that the difference the numerical value of, of the absolute value of the, um, the difference between the two stresses must not exceed 2 cu so over here we have p minus 0 less than or equal to 2 cu and here we have q minus p in the central patch less than or equal to 2, Z, 2 cu and then I've written an optimization problem here because um, we are applying the lower bound theorem here. So we're coming from below. So we want the highest possible uh, load here, the highest possible limit load, right? Uh, the highest possible lower bound. So we want to really maximize this quantity Q. And then the conditions are um, the two inequality constraints here, or oh, that's four inequality constraints. Um, if you take the absolute value into consideration and we can solve this problem you could solve it numerically or you can solve it as I'll do here graphically so um, let's take a look at the constraints first of all absolute value of P less than equal to 2 Cu if we draw a PQ diagram as shown here well don't then those condi two conditions define two limits so we must be in between these two limits and then the other um, two conditions here define another two limits and in that way we end up with a closed domain shown here in gray where uh, every pair of p and q within this domain is in principle a valid lower bound but of course we want the highest lower bound and that's up here and you can um, you can read that off as being equal to 4 cu uh, at which point the uh, horizontal stress is 2 cu so this is the solution, 4 CU, 2 CU, and, and 2 and 0, and a lower bound then of 4 CU. In this case, we know the exact solution. That's the famous uh, Prandtl solution, 2 plus pi times CU, or 5 plus 14 CU. And we can then calculate an error, and that error is minus 22.2%. We are 22.2% below the exact solution. Is this a good solution? Well, an error of 22% of, of, of is, is not fantastic. It's possibly quite all right, um, but um, it is what it is. And it is uh, below, of course, the exact solution by the lower bound theorem. Um, we can improve the solution. So this was a very, very simple uh, uh, stress field we have here. We can improve it by uh, incre increasing the number of, of, of wedges here, the number of, of these constant stress patches, and we can we can keep on uh, adding more of these wedges or increase the number of, of, of spokes in this quarter wheel, if you like, to eventually obtain the exact solution. Things get quite a bit more complicated, of course, with the with the sort of the interface uh, equilibrium equations across across these. Uh, lines here but um, it is um, it, it's doable and in that way you can um, actually by using enough of these wedges get to the exact solution so um, that's that's how that is done uh, and of course if you have a computer at your disposal then um, this could process could possibly be you know programmed and and, and then um, and then it wouldn't necessarily be such a big deal to actually get to a much better solution than the one, the simple one I, I, I just showed you. But um, a few more words about that later on. The upper bound theorem, um, in the upper bound theorem, and that's the theorem that's used as a basis of most hand calculation methods. The way it works is you postulate a mechanism of collapse. You then calculate the external work and the internal work. You equate the two. And in that way, you work out an estimate of the uh, um, collapse load. Um, and that estimate can be shown to be an upper bound on the true collapse load. Uh, 
So, um, um, but there are some, some conditions as well. So you start with a displacement field um, where, uh, from which you uh, can derive uh, some strains. These strains should satisfy what is known as the associated flow rule and the displacement boundary condition should be satisfied as well, of course, for the problem at hand. You should uh, respect the, uh, the support conditions and so on, right? So, but, but the strain displacement relations, the associated flow rule and the displacement boundary conditions, I'll just go through them in turn. If we assume small deformations, um, and that's what we always do, so up to the point of failure, uh, the structure has only suffered small deformations. That's an assumption. That's an assumption that is made in many other contexts, uh, for example, in standard finite element analysis, unless you use sort of special specialized large strain formulations. This is a sort of a standard and an uncontroversial assumption, uh, the small deformation uh, strain displacement relation. So the strains are related to, can be derived from the displacement field. Then um, the different strain components, so say normal and shear strain, they are related to each other by the normality rule or by the um, by the flow rule, um, or also sometimes the associate the so-called associated flow rule known as the normality rule, meaning that for more Coulomb the relation the ratio between the normal and shear stresses will be equal to tan phi, Tresca there's no normal stress, epsilon, and more generally you can um, fix the um, ratio between the different strain components in this way here. You can derive the strains to within a constant lambda at by uh, um, from the uh, yield function. And the way this one looks graphically, um, this is, this is um <coughs> uh, it's, it's shown here. So you have a yield function, for example, in sigma x, sigma y, and the strain vectors epsilon x, comma epsilon y are then normal to the yield surface. So epsilon x is the is the x, if you like, component, uh, the horizontal component here of this vector, and epsilon y is the vertical component. Um, so that f associated flow rule should also be satisfied. So your mechanism of collapse should satisfy the associated flow rule. And that is a, um, something that has uh, been uh, the subject of uh, quite a, debate, a lot of debate over the years. And it's a question that in many ways has not been entirely settled uh, because the flow rule, of course, um, is, 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 is related to the yield function. So the F here is the same F as governs the, the, the strength. And um, so for more Coulomb, it means that, um, so more Coulomb looks like this in tau, uh, in, in, sig in the sigma tau plane, you have an inclination here of phi, which is the friction angle, and then the strain vector in normal strains, which are associated with the, with the sigma component, and shear strains, which are associated with the, um, the shear component. It looks like this. It's normal to the yield surface. So the two components are shown here. So for a non-zero friction angle, you'll always have a normal component. You'll always have dilation, basically. So for this classical example of a rigid block on a rigid frictional surface, the way the failure mechanism should look is something like this. So you have a shear strain um, and you have a normal strain, you have a dilation. So you have basically this box lift off from the surface, which is not exactly um, particularly intuitive or necessarily what you want. You would like the box to fail simply by just sliding along the surface. But the, the upper bound theorem, the valid mechanism imposed by the upper bound theorem will uh, involve this dilation. So, um, and, and this angle here is, is um, you can do the geometry yourselves, is the same as this angle down here. The friction angle, which is, we can call this the dilation angle. So the dilation angle is equal to the friction angle for an associated flow rule. And it has to be an associated flow rule for the uh, upper bound theorem to be valid. Uh, 
you could of course say well what about a non-associated flow rule what about using uh, what about having a dilation angle separate from the uh, friction angle and you can do that but then the limit theorems the upper and bound, lower bound theorems no longer apply i'll return to that in another uh, talk uh, because of course it can be done as is done in conventional finite element analysis it can also be done in uh, optim g2 and optim g3 so just to summarize the associated flow rule uh, when applied to frictional materials is one of the more controversial aspects of limit analysis due to this dilation um, the current consensus though is that the flow rule um, or the dilation angle has obviously it has a large effect on on the on the deformations but it has less of an effect on the strength um, you can make certain corrections um, and that is also uh, so uh, basically make certain corrections to take the correct dilation angle uh, into account in this case you would want zero dilation take that into account using various approaches that are described in chapter 9 of the theorem manual of Optum G2 it's something I might return to in a later talk as well but um, it is something uh, that we know is a bit dodgy but it's nevertheless something that is um, accepted this dilation and I should say as well that all the conventional uh, and all the common uh, Tasaki's uh, bearing capacity equations all the relations you find in throughout the codes of practice are based it's never mentioned explicitly but they are based on this assumption of an associated flow rule so um so it's 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 a part of the whole uh, game um and uh, we will sort of just have to accept it not completely uncritically but um for the time being at least so an example of the application of the upper bound theorem again this strip footing on an undrained clay the Tresca uh, yield criterion is, is given by this quantity here, uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 3. So the difference between the, um, the uh, major and minor principal stresses is, of course, the, uh, is the uh, shear stress on the critical section. And that is, is ba that's uh, tw two times the shear stress on the critical section. So we could actually also write the Tresca criterion uh, at failure on the critical section we would have a shear stress equal to two cu to uh, one times cu sorry so tau is two times sigma one minus sigma three um, and the critical section is estimated as part of the solution that's basically the slip line that we will postulate uh, the slip line that defines the mechanism and in this case uh, we can see, um, so the Tresca yield condition is written like, it's shown here again, and it's written as shown here. So basically um, the strain vector here, the normality rule gives zero normal strain. So in this case, we do indeed have a box that just slides along the surface, which is, um, which is, which is, 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 is a good thing. Um, so we could uh, postulate a mechanism and I'm, I'm a mechanism and I'm going to postulate a sort of a circular rotational mechanism so we can draw this is a semicircle and uh, along this semicircle we have a we have a shear stress equal to, to cu and um, we can then postulate the mechanism of failure as a rotation um, of this semicircle so we have some stresses out here there's some strains as well and um, integrate the product of those up and then you have the uh, internal work that's basically the the quantity shown here the external work well that's basically the displacement of the external uh, of the magnitude of the external load to, uh, multiplied by by the displacement of it so that's the quantity shown here omega being being the angle of rotation here and you uh, equate the external to the internal work and in that way you work out a expression for q the uh, limit load which is in this case two times pi times cu so 
see you. Um, you can improve on this solution as well. I mean, the correct value is still 5.14, so we are above that exact solution by some amount. Um, but you can improve this uh, solution as well, but for example, by postulating a shallower mechanism, you can parameterize it by this angle up here, theta, then this angle becomes part of the expression for the internal work. You again equate the internal and ent external work uh, rates, and um, you end up with an expression that contains the quantity theta again, and you would then uh, minimize the external load with respect to theta. So we are coming from above, we want the smallest possible upper bound, and in this case we uh, get uh, to 5.52 times Cu. But if we just compare the, the, the two basic solutions um, that I showed you, so we have an upper bound of 4 Cu, we have a lower bound of 6.28 Cu, the mean value is, is uh, 5.14 Cu. So if we plot these solutions as shown here, this is the exact, this is the upper bound, this is the lower bound. Um, we can then take the mean value, that's, four, that's 5, point, that's 5 14, um, 5.14, and so the distance from the upper and lower bounds is, is um, plus minus 22%. So we could say the worst case area, error is this 22%. The actual error in this case, because remember the exact solution is 2 plus, um, two plus pi, so the actual error is actually in this case zero. Okay, so the mean value between the upper and lower bound um, is actually the exact solution. That's of course a coincidence in this case, but more often than not, for an upper bound and a lower bound with of more or less the same quality, the error you make on either side, um, they, c they balance each other out so that the mean value tends to be a very good uh, estimate of the exact solution. So in practice, the actual error is, is often something like um, the worst case error divided by 5 or 10 or something of that order. Uh, so if um, under normal circumstances for an error of 22%, we would expect, for a worst case error of 22%, we would expect an actual error uh, of something like 5 to 2 to 5 percent, let's say. I will uh, I'll return to that when we get to the optimum calculations as, as well. And, and speaking of the optimum calculations, how do we move from, from these hand calculation type methods to something that we can sort of uh, uh, solve uh, uh, more readily using uh, sort of finite element methods, or at least the finite element concept of dividing a structure into to finite elements, into well, into triangles that have some, some properties um, attached to them. Um, so th and that, that's exactly what finite element limit analysis is all about, and that's the version of limit analysis implemented in Optum G2 and G3. Um, it is to construct a mesh and then set up the equations, the kind of equations that I showed you before, set those equations up with respect to the geometry defined by this mesh, and then resolve Th and then solve the resulting optimization problem. I show you the lower bound optimization problem and also an upper bound optimization problem. Solve those optimization problems numerically. Um, and how, how does it actually work? Well, I mean, I would encourage you to have a look through the manuals. Um, the theory manual in particular has quite a bit of detail uh, about it all. Um, but just to sort of give you a feel for it, if we um, consider this hand calculation lower bound solution with here in this case five patches of constant stress, well you could sort of almost think of these five patches as five finite elements. So you have two triangle elements here, a quad here and another two triangles here. If you wanted triangles everywhere, well then you could uh, subdivide the central quad here into two triangles and you'd have six triangles um, and you could then set up the equations in some automated manner with respect to those, to that, to that uh, geometry. You could impose the interface conditions, the, the st stress boundary conditions, um, and so forth, and then end up with a optimization problem which would be proportional in size to the number of, of stress variables that you have in play. Um, and um, 
and then solve that resulting optimization problem. And that's exactly what we do in Optum G2. In practice, we don't operate with, with tr uh, constant stress triangles, but with st uh, triangles over which the stresses are allowed to vary uh, linearly. That's sort of a, a good thing to do, but the principles are the same. Um, and hand calculation upper bound uh, solutions, well, we saw that we had this rotational sort of mechanism. Um, suppose that we had subdivided the, main, the domain into triangles and then to each of these triangles had attached some uh, displacement degrees of freedom such that the triangles would be allowed to, each triangle would be allowed to move freely. So it's not exactly the same as a standard finite element mesh, but kind of, you could think of, of these triangles being connected by interfaces. And there's some conditions as, uh, associated with those interfaces. That's where the flow rule comes in. Um, but you allow each triangle to move in principle freely, subject to um, subject to there only being sliding along the edges of the triangle interfaces. So those equations can be set up as well for a given mesh, and um, we will not then be able to do something like this. We won't be able to have a slip line that cuts through the elements, but we will have uh, the possibility to have slip along the element edges so we could have a mechanism like this um, where these two rigid blocks would move something like that. And if you actually do this calculation well then you end up with 6 CU so an error that's slightly smaller than the than the circular rotational mechanism funny enough and of course as you can imagine as you add more elements you have more freedom to basically get uh, closer to the exact solution. Also in, print in uh, practice, in the way it's implemented in Optum G2, uh, not only do we have the possibility to have work done um, along the element ed uh, edges, but um, we have um, also the possibility of the elements themselves actually being plastically deformable. So um, there's an extra contribution to the internal work from the work uh, from th uh, stemming from the deformation of each of the elements. But otherwise, again, the principles are the same as for the hand calculation examples I showed you. So that is the idea. Set up this mesh and, um, and then set up the uh, discrete equations, upper or lower bound, as, as, as you wish, and then solve the resulting optimization problem. So. Um, this is what I will now switch to Optum G2 to give a, a sort of a just a brief trial of. And the problem we considered was this strip footing uh, on a Tresca soil, some undrained clay. So take the Tresca best basic, SU it's called here and not see you as in the slides, but I hope you can ignore that. And then standard fixities, some load on top. And then I will go over here to the, to, so I have an SU and under in shear strength of one, just to be able to, to, to compare. No uh, unit weight and all the other parameters are irrelevant. I have a footing up here, it's rigid and it has no, no weight. And I have the load on top here of a magnitude of 1 and I want to define, uh, to find the multiplier, um, the collapse multiplier, the number I should multiply onto this unit load of 1 in order to be at collapse. And um, so I pick limit analysis as the analysis type. I pick the element type um, and I have a, a range of options here, lower upper and then some other options um, that I'll return to in, in just a second and the number of elements and let's say something like 1000 so, and then I can press this button here, I clone the stage, I can change this to upper. So I have now two identical uh, problems, two identical stages, the only difference being here I have element type lower, I calculate a lower bound, here I have element type upper, I calculate an upper bound, let's call this LB and this one, UB, and then basically run the problem. 
So, the first cal the first number that comes out here is 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 lower is the lower bound, four point six two seven. And if I just I just want need my calculator here, and I use MATLAB as my calculator. Um, And say L for lower bound is this number here, and upper bound is this number here. I can oh, I can as well calculate the mean value, so that's L plus U divided by two, and then I can calculate some error estimates. Uh, I can say er error W C worst case is M minus L divided by M times 100%, so that's 13%, and the error, the actual error, which I'm able to calculate in this case, I'm usually not able to do that, but in this particular case I am, so that was the 5,14 um, minus M, so the error with respect to the mean value, uh, uh, sorry, minus 5, 14 divided by 514. So the actual error is 3.7 percent. So again, uh, I don't know what the ratio is here, a factor of three and a half, four, something like that. But the actual error is again quite a bit worse, uh, lower than the worst case error. But still, the worst case error of 13 percent, not too bad. If we look at the collapse mechanism. So I can set this playing here, uh, and then I can plot, say, the strains, the epsilon 1 minus e epsilon 3. Um, that is somehow the, the, the shear strain. And that looks something like, like this. And uh, I can show the mesh, just to show the mesh here. And it, it collapses like this. That's for the upper bound calculation. For the lower bound calculation, you, s you saw in the for the hand calculations we have no there's no displacements involved at all. When it comes to the numerical solution, we uh, end up having quantities um, that come out of the solution that, in a certain sense, can be interpreted as the displacements. Um, and except that they look, uh, they tend to look. Um, a bit funny, we have these discontinuities. Uh, they shouldn't be seen as real discontinuities. I mean, this foundation here doesn't, in actual fact, break, and there's um, no fracturing going on here, but this is somehow the nature of these so-called lower bound pseudo displacements. Um, but they give you a good indication, usually, of, of the failure mechanism, um, which you can see here also from the upper bound solution. You can see that it was actually slightly, it was rather unsymmetric here. There's a t tendency to a rotation here. You can ask why, when you have a symmetric problem, do you have an unsymmetric solution? And that the, uh, that is because the mesh, of course, is not symmetric, not completely symmetric. Um, so this slight deviation from perfect symmetry is what actually induces a unsymmetric and in this case a rotation a rotational failure mechanism which by the way I should say as well is exactly the kind of mechanism you see in practice if you actually do full scale load tests on foundation on on uh, on, on, on clay and so undrained sort of loading tests putting load tests you will see uh, almost always a rotational failure it'll, it'll rarely fail um, straight down like this. You can see even there's a slight rotation here actually. Now, so with this error of 13 percent, uh, what do we do? And as I said, if we increase the number of elements, we should go, we should, we sh things should get slightly better. So we can go from 1,000 to 2,000. And let's see if that will bring about any improvement. So then we have a lower bound. Remember before the error the worst case error was 13, the actual error was 
3.7. So with these two new numbers, 4.873 and the upper bound here, I don't remember exactly what we had before, but let's calculate the mean value again. And the worst case error, we are now from down from 13 to 9, and the actual error should also have dropped. Uh, well, that has actually increased slightly, funny enough. Um, so uh, the estimate we had before, the upper and lower bounds were both worse than what we had before, but the errors uh, were that we had in each of the two solutions were more similar than in the second calculation. And of course, um, these, these errors, um, if they are equal, if the upper and lower bound errors are equal, it doesn't matter if they're both 500%, one is minus 500, the other is plus 500, and uh, the error in the mean value is then, of course, zero. But the worst case error, which is the one that under normal circumstances, when we don't have the exact solution, is the one that's really relevant, that has decreased from 13 to 9. You see the collapse mechanism tends to become slightly more defined and um, this is where uh, the idea of mesh adaptivity then comes in because you can say why do you use such a course uh, such a, a what do I, why do I use a uniform mesh because I mean it's quite clear the all the action is up here all the strains are up here so why do I have to use the same size of elements out here where nothing much is going on as as up here and um, Yes, so this is, this is where mesh adaptivity comes in. There's a setting here, mesh adaptivity, yes or no, I'll say yes. And then there's two more fields that appear, uh, adaptive iterations, three, three is the default, and then the start elements, the start elements the default number is 1000. And this um, is to be interpreted in the following way. We start by solving the problem for a uniform mesh. That's the first iteration. This uniform mesh contains 1,000 elements. Then on the basis of the solution, we construct a second mesh, um, which is more adapted to the, uh, to the solution. And we do this one more time. So that's the third iteration. And we do this in such a way that we gradually work our way in the course of the three iterations from 1,000 elements, the starting number of elements, to this number up here. 2000 and we will do that for both the lower and upper bounds so that's the first iteration here i think that's the result we had before 4.63 and in the course of these three iterations we are now then at 5.025 5 and the upper bound has come down 6 point something to 5.264. Let's calculate the mean value. And you can already see now that the, uh, say the worst case error, worst case error is about 2%. So that's really quite a bit down from 13 to 9 to now 2. And the actual error is, um, well, it's even less than 0.1 of a percent. So um, yeah, so mesh adaptivity obviously is, is, is something that is, is really, really quite powerful. Um, it's something that enables you to really get to very accurate solutions really quite fast. You can see these calculations, and I'm sitting with a standard laptop here. They take a, a few seconds. Um, you can try another problem so this was was clay so undrained clay tend to problems tend to be fairly uh, easy we could take something like a a sand so um, that is with a, a cohesion of zero and this sand up here the so-called loose sand mc a friction angle of 30 degrees uh, and we have a unit weight here of 14 kilonewton per square meters and we will then um, use apply that material to both stages and calculate upper and lower bounds and while we do that I'll open up Chris Martin's ABC analysis of bearing capacity uh, 
and um, set up the problem here. So friction angle of 30, unit weight I think it was 14. We have a strip footing and it's rough. The width is, well the width is two meters here. And we don't have a surcharge, but um, I think we need to put in some number here in order for this to run. And the average pressure is what we want. And we get, this gets to a solution that's very close to the exact one in in much less time than, than Optum for these particular problems of, of foundations. Um, so say this is the exact solution, E206. And then we have lower bounds of and an upper bound of this number here. So quite a bit of difference still, even for a couple of thousand elements and, and using mesh adaptivity. Um, and the, the adaptive meshes look something like, like this. There's a rotation here as well, I believe. Yeah. And um, so anyway, the lower bound, the upper bound, the exact solution. The worst case error is then, uh, well, that's the, uh, that's the actual error is, no, <laughs> the mean value between the upper and lower bounds, I forgot to calculate that. The actual error is then is then, uh, well, minus 9%. So w the mean value 187.6 is 9% below the exact solution of 206.6. The worst case error, um, that, would be, that would be rather higher. Uh, and that is 19%. Is that a high error? Well, uh, we know that this Ngana problem is, is highly sensitive to the friction angle, and I think um, with a couple of fractions of degrees of increase in friction angle, or decrease in friction angle, you could easily go plus minus 19%. But, but never mind, let's just have a look at how we can basically improve the solution. And that can be done in two ways. We, inc we can increase the number of elements, uh, and then we will eventually get there. But a quicker way of getting there is to use a small trick that often is quite useful. You will remember here in my slides, I showed you the lower bound solution for the, um, the improved lower bound solution, where we basically put up these, we constructed this, we could say fan of elements here around the edge of the footing, because this edge of the footing here is, is what we call a singularity. There's a huge variation of the stress at this point. So sticking up in these wedges will enable uh, one to better, of course, capture that variation of the stresses at that point. In Optum G2, you can see the mesh. Uh, so the mesh here, well, we have a bit of a fan of elements around the um, around the point here, but we can insert actually a manual fan. And that's this feature up here called mesh fan. So we can include these mesh fans and in that way we can, oh, uh, we can, um, we have these, this fan of elements generated. And that usually improves the solution quite dramatically. Let's see what happens here. It's not really strictly necessary, but it's something that will uh, help you to get quicker to the uh, to the exact solution. Well, in this case, it, it actually didn't really help at all, um, neither for the upper bound nor for the lower bound. The lower bound actually turned out to be slightly worse than what we had before. So let's have a look at the mesh. Um, yeah, well, that's that's life sometimes. We have a nice fan of elements though around here. What we can do as well is we can 
specify that we want a certain mesh size at these points. This mesh size by default is 0.1, so that should probably be good. And point, oh, I now applied it to the line as well. That wasn't really necessary. So let's try to see if that will help us. So that seems to help. So we are now at a lower bound of 167 and an upper bound of 2. The mean value is this. Worst case error was 19 before, now it's 13.7. And the actual error it was minus 9 before, now it's minus, minus 6%. And, and we can keep going like that. I mean, from now on, it's just simply a question of increasing the number of elements. It, of course, doesn't help either that we have this rotational uh, mechanism, but, but that's how it is sometimes. And we can then say, let's try something like 10,000 elements. Should be able to use a couple of hundred thousand elements without too many problems. Of course, I mean, the more elements you use, the more time you have to wait. But if you really want uh, extremely accurate solutions, then, then you can increase the number of elements to, I think, two or three hundred thousand with a, with a standard PC with a standard amount of, of memory, 16 gigabytes or something like that. Uh, eventually, it's memory that becomes the problem, not so much the solution time. You can see now we've it's become slightly better, but it's still not fantastic. Uh, it's nowhere near as good as for the uh, clay problems. But eventually it is a question of just uh, using enough elements. This is, I should say as well, um, oh, this actual error little down and the worst case error is at 7% now. So. Well, I, I think this is this is actually pretty good, but this is a particularly nasty problem. This very classical in gamma problem. Um, it gets a lot easier if you give the footing a bit of embedment. We can try that. Let's not try to give it a bit of embedment. Just something like say twenty centimeters. also have, have had some surcharge. Now, I don't, we don't know the exact solution for this problem, and we can't find it with ABC either. So here, the worst case error is, is the best, really, is the only measure of, of the accuracy that we have. Uh, and Low amount. And the upper bound, and you can see they're fairly close. Or you can see that just by quick manual inspection. But let's calculate the worst case error, 3%. So the exact solution is guaranteed to be this 308.85 plus minus 3.1%. So this is um, this was a, a, a brief introduction to to limit analysis, and um, you can of course solve many other problems using this functionality in Optum G2. There's also the complementary problem or complementary analysis type of strength reduction analysis that I'll go through in a, another talk, where um, you basically have the opposite scenario. You have the loads given and then you want to know by how much do I need to uh, reduce or increase the material parameters say the friction angle in order to induce a state of collapse and that strength reduction factor that factor by which you must decrease say tan phi is um, can then be thought of as 
the factor of safety. So that's a useful kind of uh, uh, complementary analysis type to standard limit analysis. But for now, I think I will uh, I'll finish it here. See you next time.